All right, so if you are brand new to web development, getting started can seem like quite the daunting task at first. With HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, there's really no shortage of complex terminology and acronyms used within the world of web dev. Nevertheless, by focusing on the basics and dissecting these acronyms piece by piece, you'll see that web development can actually be quite easy. So to develop your first website, you really only need two things. The first being a web browser and the second being a text editor. A web browser is a program used to visit and interact with websites. You're most likely already familiar with a few of them. The most popular are Chrome, Firefox, and Safari, while a few other browsers lie behind in terms of usage and functionality, such as Edge and Internet Explorer. Most professional web developers will develop and test their sites using Chrome. Google maintains and manages Chrome, keeping it up to date and also providing helpful development tools to make debugging easier compared to other web browsers. Firefox and Safari are other popular choices for development, as they too provide robust development tools for an enjoyable user experience, while Edge and Internet Explorer are known to be a bit behind the pack. Edge, and especially Internet Explorer, are missing some web technologies that are common in other web browsers. As a result, one line of code that works just fine in Chrome, Safari, and or Firefox will be completely broken when viewing in something like Edge or Internet Explorer. Edge is a much improved version of Internet Explorer, so if you have to choose between Edge or Internet Explorer, make sure you're going with Edge because Internet Explorer is notorious for its poor code rendering. Now, if that's all you have on your computer, I really recommend just going to Chrome's official website and downloading Chrome from there. So personally, my favorite browser is Chrome and that's what I'll be using throughout the remainder of all Chris Kors's videos. Once you have a web browser, the only other tool you'll need is a text editor. A text editor is just what it sounds like. It's a program in which you can write and edit text. You can legit develop your whole website using only your computer's default notepad program. Notepad is technically a text editor. Now, even though you can develop a website completely in Notepad, I never actually recommend writing code here. There are other free downloadable text editors available that'll enhance your development experience by offering code highlighting, shortcuts, and much, much more. So to access these benefits, we'll want to download a fast, but also featureful text editor. The most popular text editors at this point in time are VS Code, Sublime Text, and Atom. Other text editors include Brackets and Notepad++, but from my experience, these are a bit behind VS Code, Sublime Text, and Atom when it comes to creating an enjoyable user experience mixed with speed. I personally use Sublime Text since I enjoy how fast it is when it comes to finding, opening, and switching between files. Other developers I know tend to lean towards VS Code since it provides a very friendly interface for downloading themes, plugins, and other tools to help your development workflow. I'd recommend checking out Sublime Text, VS Code, and Atom on your own, then making a decision in regards to which you'd like to use. No matter which you choose, you'll be able to follow along with all of the tutorials. However, if you'd like to follow my actions as closely as possible, you should definitely download Sublime Text as your editor, since that's what I'll be using throughout the remainder of my videos. So now, I want you to get your computer ready to follow along. We're going to start by downloading Sublime Text. So, to download Sublime Text, all we have to do is open up our web browser and then run a quick Google search for Sublime Text. And once the results are loaded, we'll click the first result here at sublimetext.com. Now, since I have a Mac, I'm going to click this Download for Mac button that's front and center. Sublime Text also runs on Windows, so if you're visiting this page while using a Windows machine, this button right here should say Download for Windows. Nevertheless, we'll click the button, whether we're on Windows or Mac, and it'll activate our download for Sublime Text. So once the download is finished, we'll simply click the completed download button to begin the installation process. And for Mac, Sublime Text will install. Then all you have to do here is drag Sublime Text into your applications folder. So we'll go ahead and do that now. 
And since I already have Sublime Text installed, I'm basically just replacing it so I can either hit replace or keep both. In this instance, I'm going to hit stop, but this pop-up should not occur for you if you don't already have Sublime Text installed. For Windows, you should have a quick installation wizard that allows you to specify where you'd like to install Sublime Text. So once installed, you can head to the location where we just installed it, which in our case is our applications folder. So we'll open up our finder, which can also be accessed from our dock down here. And then once we open up our finder, we'll head to our applications folder and then look for a sublime text, which is going to be right here. And we can drag this into our dock simply by grabbing the icon right here, dragging it down below. And now we have a quick way to access sublime text. So we can double click on sublime text in our finder. And now we have sublime text open with this blank notepad. So this is all a text editor is, something that we can write text and code inside of. You'll see the true benefits of using something like Sublime Text as we continue to make use of it. And if you're wondering why my version here may look a little different than yours, it's simply because I have a theme pre-installed that changes the color of my background here. Either way, we'll be able to perform all of the same tasks as we go about our development. Now, in the next couple of episodes, we're going to take a deep dive into HTML the markup language used to create content on the web. But before we take that deep dive, I wanna at least get you guys coding something that you can display in the browser. So with our blank notepad here, if we start typing some text, any text at all, it can be whatever you want. I'm just going to type welcome to Chris courses, courses, <laughs> courses, and then go to file, save, we'll be prompted to choose a location to save our file. And for organizational purposes, I like to store all of my web related projects inside of a folder called web, which I can get to by visiting my home directory here, Christopher Liss. And then inside of this home directory, I create a folder called web that stores all of my web related projects. So inside of this web folder, I'm going to make one more additional folder and I'm going to call it getting dash started. And then I'll go ahead and enter this getting started folder and say, I want to save this new file we are creating as not welcome to Chris courses, but index.html. And make sure you save it in your newly created folder wherever you want it. Where you save index.html doesn't really matter. If you don't want to save it inside of a web directory like I'm doing right now, I'd recommend saving it to your desktop for ease of access. As long as the file has a .html extension at the end of it, you should be able to use it for web development purposes. So now that we're saving index.html inside of our getting started folder, we'll hit save. And you'll see now Sublime Text displays a tab for our newly created file. So we'll head back to our finder and navigate to our web slash getting started directory where we just saved this file. So web, have a lot of folders here from other web projects, sorry if it's a little messy, getting started, and then index.html. So once you've located your index.html file, what you can do is double click it and it should open up automatically in the browser. But before I do that, I wanna make a quick note here. I've set Chrome to be the default program that opens up HTML files as indicated here by this small Chrome thumbnail icon. If double clicking index.html opens up your file in anything other than a browser, you can simply right click this file, head on over to get info, and then right here underneath this open with tab, you can specify the default program you would like to open HTML files with, which in my case is Chrome, but you could also choose other browsers such as Firefox. I'm not going to say choose Internet Explorer because I mentioned it's not the greatest browser Edge, I suppose, and then Safari as well. So with this in mind, once I double click index.html, you'll see our text is now displayed in the browser. And back in Sublime Text, let's open these up side by side. With our text here, we can start adding what are known as HTML tags. So an HTML tag looks something like this. Essentially, we are just wrapping our text in two separate tags, a beginning tag 
and an ending tag as specified by this slash here. And if I save this file now and refresh it in my browser, you'll see a bigger, bolder version of our text. Now there's a whole plethora of HTML tags available for us to use by default. Based on which tags we choose, the browser over here will render our content in different shapes and sizes. Some additional tags you can play around with before heading to the next video include h2 tags, h3 tags, p tags which stand for paragraph tags, a tags which stand for anchor tags and are used to linking to separate files, and if you're even more adventurous you can try getting an image displayed by using an image tag, although this does require a bit more knowledge to get running correctly than what we have right now. So put this into practice and start getting your text displayed in various shapes and sizes. Getting content onto a page is the very first step for creating any site, and this is exactly how my sites start out when I'm developing for professional clients around the nation. So you are one step ahead when it comes to creating a full-fledged website. It takes time, persistence, and practice to become a competent web developer, but stick with me and I promise I'll help you get there. So stay tuned and I'll see you in the next video right now. So now before we go any further, let's answer the question, what is HTML? HTML is what's known as a markup language. Now, if this already scares you, get ready till you hear what HTML stands for. Hypertext Markup Language. This, in my opinion, is a terrible acronym slash description for what HTML really is. So instead of thinking of HTML as a hypertext markup language, I want you to think of it as this. It's simply just tags that we write text in. So as mentioned, based on the tags that we use, our text is rendered differently within the browser. The most frequently used tags within any website are going to be heading tags, paragraph tags, and then also anchor tags. Available heading tags are going to be h1 tags, h2 tags, h3 tags, h4 tags, h5 tags, and then h6 tags. These heading tags are meant to indicate that the text inside of them are going to be titles. Any text that I write inside of this h1 tag is by default going to be rendered large by the browser over here. And the size of the text is going to decrease based on the number within this heading tag. So h1 tag is by default going to be the largest heading, while h6 is going to be the smallest heading. So if we go ahead and add some text inside of all six of these tags, save them, and then refresh our browser over here. You'll see that our tags start off large and then decrease in order based on whether or not they're h1 tags or h6 tags. We have an extra tag up here at the top because we are using an h2 tag for the same text. These tags are mainly used as titles. They're big, they're bold, they draw attention, and are used to describe what kind of content is being presented. A good example of a headline tag in action is within a blog post. Blog posts on Medium and even my blog are littered with different kinds of heading tags as you can see here. They're used to present an idea and separate your text into neatly organized sections simply by altering the size of your text. Note, HTML only accepts h1 through h6 tags. You shouldn't create something like an h7 tag because browsers won't know how to render this text correctly. You must use the specific tags that HTML provides. You can't make it up on your own, at least not yet this early on. I typically only use h1 through h3 tags within my daily development since I find six different tags to be a bit overkill. In my experience, I've never really needed more than three headings for any kind of web page I'm developing, so I'd recommend that you make your life easier and only stick to using h1 through h3 tags, although you're totally free to use h4 through h6 tags if you'd like. The next tag I want to introduce you to is known as the paragraph tag, which is indicated by a P. A paragraph tag contains paragraph text, any text that consists of more than one sentence. On save, Paragraph text is typically rendered by default at a 16 point font size, a standard web font size that'll ensure that your text is legible no matter what type of font that you're using. 
Whenever you have text that expands more than one sentence, you typically want to wrap it in a paragraph tag. Not only will the tag be rendered in a paragraph readable font size by default, but by using a P tag instead of a heading tag like H1 through H6, we as developers can indicate within our code here what kind of content are we actually dealing with. And this may not seem like a big deal right now since we only have a couple of tags listed here, but when our site gets larger and larger and starts using more and more tags, classifying content by wrapping it with the correct tag really goes a long way towards helping you find the exact content you'd like to work with. The last tag I'd like to introduce you to is called the anchor tag. The anchor tag is indicated by a simple A. You'll notice if you wrap text inside of an anchor tag, it turns either purple or blue and is underlined by default. This occurs since an anchor tag is what you use to link to different web pages. An anchor tag introduces what is known as an HTML attribute, a specific word written within the beginning of a tag. Each HTML tag has its own specific attributes that you can use. With the anchor tag, for instance, we can use an href attribute, which is set to two double quotations. Similar to the acronym HTML, href is another confusing acronym bestowed upon us by the development gods above. It stands for, no other than, hypertext reference, but I want you to remember it as link to. Whatever URL we put inside of these double quotes right here, when we save our file, refresh the browser, and click our link, we will link to whatever website we just linked to. So I'm going to go to chriscourses.com, select the URL, hit Command C, and then I'm going to paste this as our href attribute. So remember, href just says link to. Where are we linking to? We are linking to chriscourses.com. So if we save our file, head back to index.html, and refresh the page, and then click on our link right here, you'll see we are now redirected to chriscourses.com. If we hit back, we can change this link to whatever website we desire. It can be your own personal site, a site you really like using, a social media site such as Reddit, Facebook, etc. We can basically link anywhere using a simple anchor tag and its href link to attribute. Now, when we use the full URL of another website like we are right here, this is what's known as an absolute URL. But there's another type of link we can insert within our href attribute, and that is what's known as a relative URL. And we'll get to the description of what this is really soon. So let's ask the question, what if we want to link to another page within our website rather than something external like chriscourses.com? Well, first, we need to create another HTML file that houses the code for our new page. So similar to how we created index.html, we're going to create another file by heading to File, New File, going to File, Save, and then making sure we're in the same directory as our index.html file, we are going to save a file called about.html. So if we write some text within this about.html file, and you can use whatever tags you'd want, anything that we've just learned, I'm going to use an h1 tag that says about page. And if we hit save, we can now link to this newly created about.html file from our index.html file. So rather than referencing a unique URL like we are right here, let's go ahead and copy this whole tag, paste it below, remove the href attribute, and instead of linking to an absolute URL, we want to link to about.html. And our text here will say that this is our about page. So if we save this, head to our browser, hit refresh, we now have a link for our about page, and if we click it, we are now directed to our about page that contains all of the content within about.html. Now, one quick trick that I want to go over regarding Sublime Text is, right now to jump between our two separate files, we have to click the tabs right here, and you'll see I just accidentally exited out of index.html. Well, how do I open that back up? I would have to go to File, Open, and then click index.html, 
and now it's open in another tab. But that's kind of annoying having to go to file open and then selecting a file individually. It would be much more efficient if we had all of our files listed out on the left hand side. And that is something that we can do with Sublime Text. So a very quick way to open up all of your files for your project and have them show on the left hand side here is to go to your project directory using your finder. And you'll see our project directory is called getting started within our web folder. It houses index.html and about.html. So if we just grab this directory and drag it on top of our Sublime Text icon and release, you'll see we now have our project open up in Sublime Text rather than just two separate individual files. And this is useful because if we accidentally do something like exit out of index.html like I did earlier, we can easily reference it again simply by clicking index.html on the left rather than having to go to file open over and over and over again. So we'll get rid of our original Sublime Text window and we're going to use this new project window instead because this is really going to save you a ton of time as your project begins to grow and you have more and more files within it. So let's go back and focus within our anchor tag. This link right here to about.html is known as a relative link. Since about.html is within the same folder as index.html, we don't need to prefix our link right here with something like chriscourses.com. All we have to do is write the file name instead. This is especially useful when developing websites because if we had a ton of links on our site and they were all referenced using an absolute URL like we had above, well, what would happen if we would like to change our domain name here? If we decided we don't want to be branded underneath chriscourses.com, we'd prefer to be branded under something, I don't know, uh, corpsecourses.com is what my sister used to call it for fun. Uh, we would basically have to go through every single link within our site and make sure that we change the URL right here. So instead of Chris Courses, we would call it Corpse Courses. So, so dark, I know. And really, this is just tedious. It's annoying. You don't want to have to do this. Instead of having to change all these links with a relative URL, like about.html, you don't need to worry about this domain name portion. You just need to worry about what file you want the user to link to. So the rule of thumb is if you're linking to a page on your site, such as about, then that is when you use a relative URL like about.html. But if you're linking to an external site, then that is when you use an absolute URL, a URL that contains HTTPS, slash slash, the domain name, etc. So overall, this is a pretty good example of how websites are made. We essentially add content to our different pages, such as index.html and about.html. We use heading tags, we use paragraph tags, anchor tags, etc., to create content for our site. In total, there are about 110 tags that HTML provides. But really, honestly, don't feel like you have to learn all of these. I am pretty sure that I only use a maximum of 15 different tags at most throughout every site that I develop professionally. And you've pretty much already learned five of my 15, which is H1, H2, H3, P, and A. There are other more general tags we'll have to cover at some point, but for now, let's get to the fun parts and cover image tags next. So let's get right on into it and learn how to use image tags to display images on our website. So image tags are a little different from text tags. While a text tag like H1 has both a beginning and a closing tag, an image tag is what's known as self-closing, meaning it only consists of just one tag. So now I know I said think of HTML simply as tags that we write text in. While this is true, there are a few tags that don't necessarily require any text to be written within the opening and closing tags, but rather we reference assets such as the location of an image by using that tag's default attributes. If that doesn't make sense at the moment, it will shortly as we put the image tag to use. But for now, all I want you to remember is a self-closing tag is a tag with a slash at the end of it, indicating that there is no closing tag 
only a beginning tag. So the point of an image tag is to display an image on our site over here. An image tag can be created using the keyword IMG. And note, as mentioned, this is a self-closing tag, meaning there is no ending tag associated with it. Now, when I hit save and then refresh the browser, you'll notice that nothing happens even though our image tag is still technically rendered by the browser, which we can check by opening up our dev tools and then scrolling down to our HTML and you'll see our image is rendered, but we don't actually see any image. An image tag has its own set of attributes required to get an image to show. And the most important attribute is what's called SRC, a source attribute, which we're going to set equal to two empty quotation marks. So SRC stands for source. The source attribute is meant to indicate the source of whatever file we would like to display. And when I refer to source, what I really mean is what is the path or link to the image file? So similar to an anchor tags href attribute where we can reference either an absolute or a relative link, with an image tags source attribute, we can do the same thing. We can reference an image by its absolute path or we can reference an image by its relative path. So to start, we are going to reference an image using an absolute URL. If we head to any website that has an image on it, such as chriscourses.com, we can scroll to the very bottom and find this nice logo on a white background. If I go ahead and right click this, then click copy image address. We can now paste that address as our source attribute, save our file, check our web page. I'm going to exit out of the console. And now if I refresh the page, we're going to see our logo being rendered. This link that we just pasted right here, this is what's known as an absolute URL. Using an absolute URL for an image's source attribute is a great quick way to grab and display images from other websites like chriscourses.com. A few things to keep in mind though, when using other websites images, you need to get permission from the image owner and you should be aware if someone ever makes a change to that image's URL, for instance, if I were to change this URL right here on my site, your site would render a broken image. Using images from someone else's site definitely gives the opportunity for your image to break at some point in time. So as a result, it's much safer to use a relative URL here instead of an absolute URL because with relative URLs, you have full control over whether or not the location of this image changes. So to display an image using a relative URL, the first thing we need to do is actually download an image locally. So if we head back on over to chriscourses.com, we can actually download this image simply by right clicking it, then clicking the option save image as. And I'm going to save this logo as chriscourses-logo hit save and it's going to save to my downloads directory for the time being. So this will start the download process. As you can see, we now have the logo downloaded down here and it just went to my downloads folder. So I'm going to open up my finder, head on over to downloads, but actually since this finder window is already opened up within our project directory, I'm going to leave this one finder window as is. Rather, I'm going to open up a new finder window, which I can do with file, new finder window, and then head on over to my downloads directory where we now have our recently downloaded Chris Courses logo file. So this web file is an SVG. An SVG is a web image that never loses its resolution no matter how big or small we make it. So you'll see here, if I change its height, we never lose any resolution even though we just expanded it by four times the size. So they're really useful for things such as logos, anything that's kind of more like design-like rather than an actual image taken with a camera can be saved as an SVG. You just need to make sure that you use the right programs such as Adobe XD, Adobe Illustrator, and so forth to export a logo as such. So SVG lesson aside, let's head back to our finder windows and we are going to drag this SVG icon into our project directory, which remember is getting started. Now, if you would like to use something other than an SVG, you're more than welcome to use a JPEG file or a PNG file. 
Both types of those files will work in this case and you can use them within your image tag similar to how we're doing so with an SVG. So we have our logo inside of our project directory, but it's good to start organizing your files early on. Once your project has more than 5 to 10 HTML or image files, things will start getting messy, making it hard to find whatever it is you're looking for. So for our images, we're going to right click within Finder, click New Folder, and we'll just make a simple image folder called IMG for short, and then drag our logo inside of it. So now that we have a logo that is relative to both index and about.html, we can reference this logo from one of these two files. So let's minimize our finder windows and exit out of this one actually. First thing we're going to do is duplicate our image tag. So command C and then command V and we'll get rid of the absolute URL inside of it. And then all we have to do is locate our image within our project folder. So looking at our project folder up here on the left, where do we actually have to go to locate our image? Well, we know our image folder is within our project's root directory and our root directory is whatever main folder houses our entire project. So our root directory in this case would be getting dash started. And so since the image folder is within our root directory, we can reference our image folder by typing dot slash and all this dot slash means is we're starting from whatever directory index.html is inside of. And then we would need to head inside of our image directory. So we'll type IMG, peek inside of our image directory, and then reference our logo name. So in this case, it's going to be Chris Courses logo SVG. So now on save and browser refresh in our actual file you'll see our site displays two logos instead of one. The difference being that the first image right here is referencing an absolute URL from chriscourses.com, while the second is referencing a relative URL located within our site project. One quick note I wanna make is if your image is not showing, just really make sure that you have the name right here. If this name is wrong in any way, any misspelling at all, your image won't be referenced correctly and you'll see a broken image link. So really just make sure you double check your name if it is not showing on the right hand side in the browser. If you want to make sure that your image always renders without worry of a site owner taking down or changing an image, always go with relative URLs like we did right here. The location of your files, like we have inside of our image directory, are only going to be changed if you change them yourself. So we are safe to know that this image shouldn't change at any point down the line. Now, this is a pretty good intro into getting images displayed on a website, but there really is one more attribute I'd like to cover, and that is what's known as the alt attribute. Alt stands for alternate text. Basically, it's text that should display in place of your image. It'll only show if your browser has trouble loading the image due to something like a poor internet connection, or you tell your browser to turn off all rendering for all images. The alt tag basically acts as a description for your image in case the image doesn't actually load. It's also used for people who have poor vision who need to use a screen reader for their internet browsing. Basically, their screen reader literally reads them the site from top to bottom, any text that we have, including the alternate text that we're using to describe our image here. If they can't see it, well, we can set up our site so they can hear it. To keep your sites as accessible as possible, it's important that you always include the alt attribute and provide a description for whatever image you're referring to. So in this instance, since we're referencing a couple of Chris Corus's logos with a spaceship, we can write exactly that. We'll just say our alt text should be Chris Corus's spaceship logo. And now our browser can tell what our image is even if it can't physically view it. And we want to do this for all of our images. So we know our relative path is a Chris Corsa spaceship logo. We want to make sure that our absolute path image also has that same description. So now to test that your alt tags work, what we can do is in Chrome, you can click this vertical ellipses icon, head down to the settings option. And then once here, you're going to want to search for site settings. So if you click into site settings, and then scroll on down until you find images, you can click that, and then there's going to be a little toggle switch. 
So once you toggle this off, images for all websites will only show their alt text if it exists. And hopefully they do exist if the web developer took into consideration accessibility. So once you turn this off, head back to your index.html tab and then refresh the page. And you'll see our images no longer display, but they do display the alternate text. So we know our alt text is working in case we don't want to display images or for people who use screen readers who want to know what the image is, but they have trouble actually seeing it. We know we want to view images, so we'll head back to settings, hit the toggle to make sure that they're turned back on, refresh the page, and we'll be good to go. So now I want you to download some images on your own, reference their absolute URLs, and then also download them to your project's image directory so you can reference them as relative URLs, like this as well. This is exactly how professional developers get their images to display on the web. So you are one step closer to reaching professional status. We've covered almost everything about HTML required to get a full website up and running, but really there is still more to learn. What if we want to display not images, but video instead? Stay tuned and we'll be covering that next, right now. Now you may think that since a video is like an image just moving, that a video tag is probably self-closing just like an image tag, right? Wrong. A video tag works a little differently than you might expect compared to an image tag. Essentially, all browsers provide support for common image types like JPEGs, PNGs, and SVGs. And by providing support, all I really mean is that the browser will allow the image to be rendered as long as the file is of a type JPEG, PNG, or SVG. However, for video, some browsers only provide support for certain video types. If you try using a WebM video for something like Safari or Internet Explorer, the browsers won't render it because they aren't programmed to understand the WebM file type. So as a result, it was deemed necessary that the video tag is not self-closing, but rather a standard tag that requires self-closing source tags inside of it. So let's head back to the code to show you exactly what I mean by this. So a video tag is a standard tag, meaning it has one opening tag and one closing tag. But inside of this video tag, we need to use self-closing source tags to help indicate the location of our video. So a source tag looks like this. And inside of our self-closing source tag, it has a source attribute equal to the location of our video. Now, why would we want to reference a video source like this? Why can't we just take the source attribute and reference it within our video tag instead? Well, technically we can, but as mentioned, since some browsers have trouble rendering different types of video, we need a way to reference other file types in case the browser does not render the original video. So to create a method in which we can fall back to a different file type, the creators of the video tag essentially added embeddable source tags, allowing multiple file types of the same video to be used. To see this in action, we can head on over to chriscourses.com for this specific video, and in the description are going to be two links, one being an MP4 and one being a WebM. These links will also be available on the YouTube version of this video in the description. So if you're watching on YouTube, just scroll down a bit and you should see these two links. So we're going to start off by grabbing the WebM version. We'll just copy it and then paste it into our source attribute inside of our video tag. So if we save this, head back to our web page and hit refresh, we'll see our video rendered in Chrome. And yeah, I pretty much 100% hate myself for using this video as an example because man, with a face like this, this really, this is really only a face that a mother can love. So we'll just, uh, yeah, we'll just deal with this for now. It's all, it's all good, promise. So obviously we have an issue here. We referenced a video tag, but this video is still, it's not actually playing. So to get this video to play, what we can do is on top of our video tag, we can add an autoplay attribute. And if we save this and refresh the page, you'll see the video still isn't playing actually. 
This is due to a feature that Chrome provides. And I know you may be asking, well, how is this a feature? We specified that we want to autoplay the video, but Chrome is not allowing us. Well, essentially, Chrome didn't want websites spamming you with autoplaying videos that also use audio. So I know for a fact, back in the day, when I would visit ESPN.com and click on an article, they pretty much always autoplay their videos. And I know maybe this isn't the greatest example because these aren't autoplaying, but their autoplaying videos would always have audio playing in the background. And it really was annoying as hell. The videos would play with audio, even though I never wanted to watch the thing in the first place. It created a poor user experience because really in order to read the article, I had to manually mute or pause the video playing in the background. So what Chrome did was they decided enough was enough and they updated their browser to only allow the auto playing of videos if they are muted by default. So heading back to our website, even though our video tag is set to auto play, it's not actually going to auto play in Chrome because we need to also add a muted attribute. And this way Chrome knows we aren't trying to spam the user with some sort of audio video. So once we save this and then refresh our page, we'll see the video is now playing. But this is really only because Chrome is a browser that supports the WebM file type. So really quick, if we go ahead and copy our URL and then open up another browser that does not support WebM, looking at use Safari for Mac users and Internet Explorer for Windows users, gonna open up Safari and then paste my link inside of there, you'll see our video isn't even rendered. And this is exactly why video tags allow for multiple sources to be embedded inside of them. So when it comes to choosing a save video type, I pretty much always recommend to export your video in MP4 format instead of something like WebM. Every browser supports the MP4 file type. So really, if you wanted, you could just use the source attribute directly within the video tag. In our case though, since we already have a WebM video being rendered, we'll keep it there and we're just going to duplicate the source tag, paste it below, and then get rid of the source attribute. And we'll also get rid of the source attribute we put within our video tag. So if we are using a browser that cannot render a WebM video, we'll fall back to a different video file that the browser can render, aka an MP4. So as you might have noticed, within the video description, there was also an MP4 file type. So what we're going to do is grab this whole thing, copy it, and then paste it into our second source attribute. So on save and refresh within Chrome, you'll see we still only have one video playing because we only have one video tag. The video tag over here just prioritizes whatever source comes first. So Chrome is playing the WebM file type. But if we head on over to Safari and hit refresh, now our video is also playing here because we provided the MP4 file type, something that Safari actually supports. That handily covers the basics of the video tag, but we'll want to go over a few additional attributes that you'll use within your day-to-day -day development. So one quick one, and this is more of a general HTML attribute, meaning it can be used on most HTML tags, is within our video tag, we can declare what width we'd like the tag to be rendered at. So obviously this, this video is way, way, way too large. What we want to do is add a width attribute to it and set it equal to something smaller like 400 pixels. So if we save this and then refresh the page in whatever browser you'd like to use, you'll see our video is much smaller and easier to view compared to the large version we had before. So other video attributes that I use from time to time include the controls, poster, and loop attributes. So we'll start with controls. By adding a controls attribute to our video tag, on save and refresh, when hovering over our video, we are now presented with a set of controls to control our video. These controls are provided by the browser by default. So if we look at the controls here in Safari and then compare the controls to the ones in Chrome, you'll see that they are slightly different. There's nothing wrong with using native controls and having them rendered differently by other browsers. Browsers typically enhance their control set for optimal viewing experience, but if you'd like to keep your controls consistent across all browsers, you can definitely develop your own set of controls after you learn the basics of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript.
So the next video attribute I'd like to go over is the poster attribute. The poster attribute simply references the location of an image to display before your video is actually played. You can kind of think of it as your video's thumbnail, similar to all the thumbnails you've probably seen on sites like YouTube or Vimeo. So since our video is set to autoplay right now, we can't really see this poster attribute in action just yet. So what we're going to do is remove our autoplay attribute and then add a poster attribute equal to an empty string. So now if we refresh the page, you're going to see, oh God. <laughs> yeah, I slightly regret taking off that autoplay because uh, yeah, you know, the, you know the deal. But uh, thankfully the poster attribute can fix this kind of thing. So if our beginning thumbnail isn't particularly flattering or we'd just like to use something custom, we can add whatever image we'd like to this poster attribute over here and our video will display something different before playing. So to grab a different image, I'm going to go to the free stock photo site, unsplash.com. And this is a great website if you ever need to use free high quality photos or videos across your website. My designer friends always go to this site in particular to reference their images. So it's definitely a respected site for free photos. So I'm just going to find the first reference photo that I like. I'm just gonna scroll through a couple of these. I think this is definitely the one I wanna choose for sure. So I'm going to copy the image, just right click on the image, hit copy image address, and then paste it in as your poster attribute. All you have to do is hit save, and then head back to your website. And on browser refresh, we have a completely new thumbnail for our video when it's not on autoplay. And if you would like for this thumbnail to fit perfectly, you'd just have to use a design program to make sure that your image here has the same aspect ratio of your video to fill the whole thing. Now, the last attribute I'd like to cover for the video tag is going to be the loop attribute. So heading back to chriscourses.com, if I go ahead and visit the homepage, and scroll down a bit. You'll see that I have a video that plays on mute automatically. And eventually once the video reaches the end, it replays from the beginning. This occurs since I've added the loop attribute to my video. So heading back to our site, if we want our video here to loop, we'll simply go to our video tag and add the attribute loop. It's as simple as that. So now if we save the file, refresh the page, play our video, and then we're just going to fast forward to the end, you'll see that our video automatically restarts at the beginning. And let's just see that one more time. Just restarts automatically because we included this loop tag. And just really quickly, if you're wondering why all my attributes are stacked on top of each other, this is totally valid HTML and I do recommend styling your code this way. It just makes your code easier to read than if all these attributes were to be placed right next to each other. So for code cleanliness, making your code easy to read, you're totally able to stack your attributes on top of each other like I'm doing here. So that pretty much covers everything you'll need to know regarding the video tag. As long as you're aware of the file type issues between browsers and know about the attributes that I just covered, you really should be good to go. So we'll cover some additional concepts related to both video and images later, mainly regarding compression, but for now, let's head on to layout tags like section and div, the most important tags you'll need to know outside of the content tags that we just covered. So stay tuned and I'll see you in the next episode right now. There are going to be times in which you need to group certain elements together. A header, for instance. A header consists of a logo and navigational elements to link to other pages. If we just wanted to change the header's background color, we could try adding style tags to each of the individual elements we want within our header. But you'll quickly find out that adding a background color to individual elements isn't going to get the job done. We actually need a container for those elements in which we can then add a background color to. So this brings up an important concept within HTML, and that is we can put HTML tags inside of other ones. There's really no limit in regards to how many tags you can put inside of another. You can have elements that nest only one tag inside of them, or elements that nest as many as eight to 10 tags instead. 
The best way to understand layout tags is to see them in action. So let's head back to our code where we left off. Now, the most commonly used layout tags are header tags, nav tags, section tags, footer tags, div tags, and then span tags. These tags act as containers for other elements. So if we want to group together some tags that act as a header for our site over here, we would create a header tag at the very top of our file. So we'd create an opening header tag and a closing header tag. Now, as mentioned, a header typically consists of a logo and also navigational elements that we can use to jump between pages. So as a result, we'll want to grab our logo, which we already have saved as an image tag down here. And to grab this, we will simply select our line of code and then cut it out with Command X. And when you're cutting this out, just make sure you're using the relative version because that is the version we would use within an actual website. So we'll hit Command X and then scroll on up to the top. And inside of our header tag, we'll press Enter, give it a nice space, and then paste in our logo with Command V. So one common rule of thumb when you're placing one tag inside of another like we just did here, you should always give the nested tag one tab's worth of indentation. So your tags should never look like this. Since image is inside of header, all we have to do is hit tab to give it some spacing. And this allows you to easily scan your file and see what elements are inside of the tag. The indenting becomes especially useful as your file starts to grow and you have to nest more and more elements inside of your tags. So on save and browser refresh, all that's changed is our logo has moved to the top of the page. And we could have done this without the header tag. You'll see if I select our image tag and delete our header tag, pasting an image and then saving and refreshing the browser, everything looks exactly the same even without the header tag. But we're going to go ahead and revert this change, making sure that we keep our image tag nested inside of header so you can really see why this header tag comes in handy later on. So the next thing that a header needs is a navigation menu. Thankfully, HTML also provides a nav tag element to group and indicate what other tags are related to our site's navigation. So beneath our nested image tag, we will insert a beginning nav tag and then a closing nav tag. This nav tag will house all of our site's links and it is still a completely valid HTML. So how do we actually navigate to other pages? Well, we can use our trusty anchor tags, of course. So we'll go ahead and grab a few of these anchor tags, just cut them out of their current location, and then paste them within our newly created nav element. Once pasted inside, we'll want to make sure our indentation is intact so we can see exactly what elements are nested with inside of nav. Then we will hit save and refresh our browser. And everything still looks about the same, except now we have our links nested up here at the top. And since everything really still looks the same, even though we have this new nav tag and header tag, this kind of begs the question, are these header and nav layout tags actually being rendered? Well, we can double check this by using our inspect tool within the browser. So if we right click the element we'd like to inspect, a dropdown will appear with the option inspect. And if we click this, we now enter our browser's inspect mode, which you may have noticed me using earlier in the series. This is just a way to view how your code is actually rendered in the browser. It's really great for debugging and I use it constantly throughout my day-to-day -day development as a professional developer. So if we look at our rendered HTML, you'll notice that all of our tags are still here, including our layout tags like header and nav, even though they don't really seem to be doing anything. If we hover over our header and nav elements, however, you'll see that we're actually hovering over all of the elements inside of it as well, meaning we successfully grouped our elements. And this comes in handy for doing things like changing the background color of this entire group here. So to change the background color of our header tag, we'll want to create what's known as a style attribute. And this style attribute takes a very specific list of key pair values that indicate how the element should look. We're going to cover these styles in depth in the next course, Intro to CSS, but for now, 
let's just add a background color style, which we can do by adding the key background, oops, not background, background dash color colon inside of our style tag. And then we're going to specify what color do we want to set our background color to. And these colors can be written in plain text, colors we use every day, such as red, yellow, green. So we're just going to add a red color for our background color. So once we save this and then refresh our page in the browser, you'll see that our background is now red. And if we change this background color to something else, such as green, save, refresh, you'll see the background changes green, etc. If you'd like to see the exact list of base colors you can choose from, you can inspect your header element and then head down to this element style box. And this might be on the right hand side if your browser is large like this. And then select your color, delete it. And Chrome will automatically populate a list of available colors to choose from. And you'll see if I press the down arrow key on my keyboard, we can scroll through all of these colors until we find one we'd like to use. So as good design practice, I would actually probably leave this header as white the same way I've done things on just chriscourses.com over here when we're actually on different pages. So if I head on over to a courses page, you'll see I just left the header as white because there's really no need to make it a different color. But heading back to our file for illustrative purposes, I'm going to assign my header a very light color, which would still be considered a better design choice compared to using something contrasty such as red. So I'm just going to search through this list of colors until I find one I like, something that's just super light. And I think I'm going to go with Azure. It's very hard to see, but it's still light enough to not cause too much contrast between the white section beneath it. And once you select your color over here in the browser, you want to make sure you also update it within your code. Chrome will not automatically update your code file. Everything you change here in the browser has to be updated in your code also. So we'll head up to our background color and change green to Azure and on save and browser refresh. Now our header color persists. So without using this header tag right here, two things would happen. One, within our code, when scrolling through it, we'd have a harder time indicating what elements are actually related to our header. So if we get rid of this header tag and even our nav tag right here, Scrolling through our code, well, what would actually indicate what elements are supposed to be related to our header tag? We don't really have any way to classify our header since we got rid of the header tag in the first place. The second thing that would happen without our header tag is we would have to add a background color attribute to every element we'd like to change the background color of. So if we were to do that just really quickly, You'll see it's a bit of a time staking process. It muddles up your code since now we have this big large style attribute put on every single one of our tags. And even then on save and refresh over here, things are not going to be rendered correctly due to the default styling of certain tags. So we want all of these tags to be surrounded in a blue background, but right now they're separated from each other because they don't have a container tag like header. So let's revert all this back to our header tag with the background color Azure. And in all header, nav, and all layout tags really act as classification tags within our code when scrolling through a file. And they also act as container elements in which we can easily alter all of the items inside of them. So scrolling back down to the bottom, other tags that we haven't covered just yet include the section tag, the footer tag, the div tag, and then the span tag. So let's focus on the section tag right here. Section tags help classify groups of content located between a site's header and then a site's footer. So heading back to chriscourses.com, you'll see when I full screen this on the homepage, I have my site organized into different boxed sections. This top section here with the hero would be considered one. This popular courses section would be considered another, etc. What this allows me to do is change the background color for one section and then change it for another while keeping all of the elements inside of these sections neatly organized. So on our site, let's say we'd like to include a section that contains all of our heading and then our paragraph tags. 
and then we want to change the background color of just that section. Well first, let's go ahead and save our file and get rid of this hideous blue background, changing it back to Azure since we reverted back to that element, and then we'll focus on our heading and paragraph tags. So scrolling up within index.html, we know that these are all the tags we want to wrap within a section. So all we have to do here is create a beginning section tag, and then indent everything we want to put inside of the section tag, and then create a closing section tag. So now on save and refresh, nothing's really happened just yet, but if we inspect our heading tags, you'll see they're now nested inside of a section tag. So we're off to a good start. Now to change the background color for the section element, we will simply add a style tag with the key background color set to whatever background color we'd like. And I'm not really sure what background color I'd actually like for this, so I'm going to head into this little element style bracket, type background dash color here, hit tab, and now I can scroll through this list of colors to find something that I like. And since my text is already dark, I'm going to go for another very light color. Not Azure, but something still pretty light. Let's go with Alice Blue. So I know Alice Blue looks good here. So now I can add it to our section tag, Alice Blue, all one word. And now on refresh, you'll see that color persists for our entire section. Now we do have one stray heading tag outside of this section with the Alice Blue background. So to get that inside of there, all we have to do is either delete this all together if we don't want it, or we can just select it, cut it out of its location, and then paste it into our newly created section. So now on refresh, all of our headings and our paragraph text is now inside of this section with the color Alice Blue. Simple enough. So let's head on to our footer tag. The footer tag is almost the same exact thing as the section and header tag. The only difference is it classifies where our footer is within our code. So first thing first, pause the video and see if you can wrap the rest of our site's elements inside of a footer tag giving it a background color separate from the section above it. Make sure you use good indentation, and when you're ready, press continue. So to wrap the rest of our site's elements inside of a footer tag, we can simply head beneath our section tag, create a beginning footer tag, and then we're going to select everything that we want to put inside of this footer tag, give it one indentation space, and then add a closing footer tag. Now we can head back up to our beginning footer tag and give it a style of background dash color set to Azure since I want this to be the same color as our header up here. So when I save and refresh, you'll now see our footer has the same background color as our header. Your footer should look something like this. If it doesn't, just double check your tags to ensure that you have both an opening and a closing tag surrounding the elements you'd like to put inside of it. Now, the last two layout elements I'd like to cover are probably the two you'll use the most within your day-to-day -day development, and those are no other than the div and the span tag. So let's focus on the div tag. A div tag is a generic layout element. It is used to group and classify elements that may not have a straightforward classification. The div tag is rendered exactly the same as the header, footer, section, and nav tags. The only difference is its name. If you're not sure what tag should be used to group certain elements together, it's a good sign you should probably just go with a generic div tag. It stands for a divisor, but really, you can just think of it as group. Div is a generic grouping tag. So what we could do here is, all of these tags that classify certain sections such as footer, section, nav, and header, etc. All of these can actually be replaced with div, something more generic than those specific tags. So if we replace section with div and also footer with div as well, and refresh our page over in the browser, you'll notice everything still looks exactly the same. The reason we use those specific tags such as header, footer, section, etc. over div is because it helps us navigate our code better and understand which portions of our code are associated with our header, which are associated with this section right here, and which are associated with the footer. 
So you're more than welcome to use a div tag instead of header, footer, nav, etc. But really it makes more sense to be specific within your code so you can easily find what it is you're looking for. Now a span tag is similar to a div tag as it's also a generic wrapping element, the difference being its default styling is different from that of a div. So heading to the top of our file right beneath our header tag, let's create two elements. The first one is going to be a div tag with the text div inside of it, and the second is going to be a span tag with no other than the text span inside of it. So on save and browser refresh, you'll notice that we have two identical tags, the only difference being that the text is actually different. However, if we duplicate these tags, so we'll duplicate div, and then also duplicate span, on save and refresh, you'll notice that the div tags are actually stacked on top of each other, while the span tags are placed next to each other. This is exactly what I mean when I say certain tags have certain default styles associated with them. If we inspect our div tag and make this full screen, you'll see that it has a default display style of block, meaning that it takes up the entire width of its parent container. So its parent container is actually the body tag. And you'll see on hover, the body tag takes up the entire width of the screen. So as a result, the div tag also takes up the entire width of the screen because it has a display of block. A span tag, however, has a display of inline by default, meaning it only takes up the width of whatever content is inside of it. And since it only takes up the width of the text inside of it, there is room for another span tag to be placed next to the first one, since all span tags by default have this display of inline. I typically only use span tags for grouping elements that should be on the same line, such as anchor tags. And even then, I use span tags way less than I do div tags, because typically your elements will be block elements, and as a result, you want to use that generic div tag to group elements around your site. So this really only scratches the surface when it comes to grouping HTML elements in a straightforward, logical manner that actually makes sense. In order to obtain a full understanding, you really need to know the basics of CSS, a language used to style HTML tags. We'll be covering CSS in the next course, but before we get there, we'll want to cover a few more HTML tags to ensure that your site actually renders correctly across old and newer browsers. So stay tuned and I'll see you in the next episode right now. So our site isn't exactly the best looking, but really that's okay because what makes a site look good is its CSS, not so much the HTML portion of things. Nevertheless, before we head to CSS and start making our site look good, we have a few more essential tags that we need to cover. The first three of these tags are the HTML, head, and body tags. Although these tags aren't required to get HTML rendering in the browser, they do help browsers render your HTML consistently. Basically, these tags are grouping tags for the browser. The other tag we'll be covering is the comment tag, which I suppose isn't really a tag, but more so a syntax that tells the browser you don't want a specific portion of your HTML rendered. So let's start by looking at our project and adding in HTML head and body tags. Now, the first tag we'll be dealing with is the HTML tag. And this is just a basic tag that represents the root of your HTML document. So any HTML we write, such as everything from header down to the bottom of our document, must be encased in an HTML tag up here because browsers and search engines use this HTML tag to render your code correctly. So to wrap everything in an HTML tag, we'll take this closing tag right here, making sure we have this beginning tag in place, We'll scroll down to the very bottom and then paste in our closing HTML tag. And then since everything is wrapped inside of this HTML tag, we want to make sure that the contents are indented one tab to the right for good code cleanliness practices. And once you wrap everything inside of this HTML tag, you don't really need to ever worry about it again. You just have to keep in mind that all your page's content needs to go inside of it. 
So the next tag we'll want to add in is going to be the body tag. And the body tag is very similar to the HTML tag that we just put in, as it's used so browsers and search engines can accurately render your HTML. Similar to our header and our section and also our footer tags, the body tag is a container that classifies where our site's main content should go. And when I refer to our site's main content, I mean anything that should be displayed in the browser. So since we know everything displayed in the browser consists of our tags from header all the way down to this ending section tag right here, what we can do is take all of this content and then press command X to cut and then paste it inside of our body tag. And same deal as before, we just wanna make sure that we're always indenting things correctly. If you're wondering how my indentation happens so perfectly, it's because I'm using a plugin called Prettier to automatically format my stuff. But really what you see right here is how you want your code to look. Your body tag should be inside of your HTML tag indented one space to the right. And then all of your site's content should be inside of your body tag indented one space to the right of the body tag. Scrolling through this, you see we have perfect indentation throughout. So to summarize, HTML is the root for everything in our document, while body is the root tag for all the HTML tags we already wrote. And really all that leaves us with is what's known as the head tag. Like the body tag, the head tag will always go right inside of your root HTML tag. It should be placed before the body tag and right after this HTML tag right here, because you can kind of draw the comparison of a head being on top of a body so head goes right above the body. Now the head tag is a container for what's known as metadata. And this really just means this is a place inside of these head tags where we can import other files and provide additional data related to the website that we're displaying over here, but without actually having this data displayed, if that makes sense. Let's put this into action. So inside of our head tag, we can insert what's known as a title tag. And whatever text we write inside of this tag, such as let's just say Chris courses, is going to be displayed within our browser tab up here. So if we save our file and then refresh the page, you'll see our tab just changed from index.html to say Chris courses instead. And this is a great example of metadata. It's data that doesn't necessarily get rendered within the body of our document like the rest of our HTML here, but rather it provides the browser with additional information such as Chris courses for our tab title to create a better viewing experience or more optimized response for search engines. Now there are a couple more tags that we can use within our head tag, but do we really need them at the moment to create a functional website? In my opinion, no. The remaining tags you'd use within head are for optimizing your website search results on a search engine like Google or for importing CSS or JavaScript files. And I'm a big believer of only implementing the exact tags you need when you actually need them. So since we're nowhere near launching our site, there's really no need to optimize for search engines at the moment. And since we haven't learned CSS or JavaScript just yet, there's really no need to use link or script tags to import CSS or JavaScript files. Any additional HTML for this file will be added as we start learning other skills, but there is one more crucial tag that I'd like to cover, and that tag is the comment tag. So a comment tag is used to comment out specific portions of your site. If there's something over here you don't want displayed in the browser, but you'd still like to keep the code, this is when you'd use a comment tag. So let's say we want to comment out all of our headlines just to see how our site looks using only the paragraph text within here. So to comment out these headline tags, we'd basically go ahead and find them within our HTML. And here they are. And to comment these out, right before our H2 tag here, we can write left caret exclamation point dash dash, and you'll see sublime text automatically grays out everything after this syntax we wrote. And everything in gray won't be read by the browser over here. And we can test this by hitting save and then refreshing our browser. And you'll see now we're missing all of the content that comes after that syntax we just wrote with the left care exclamation double dash. So to declare where exactly we'd like this comment to end, we would add a dash dash right caret to the end of whatever HTML we don't wanna see over here. And you'll see once I add that, everything else lights up down below. 
but our headlines are all grayed out, meaning they won't show over here. So on save and browser refresh, now all of our other content shows, but our heading tags are now invisible. However, we can still see them in our code if we'd like to edit them at some point in time later on. So say we actually want to keep these heading tags. Well, we can simply remove this double dash side caret and then this beginning common caret, hit save and then refresh our page. And now you'll see everything is back to the way it was. Commenting is especially useful for prototyping or even just writing plain notes. If there's something in your code you might have trouble understanding at a later point in time, you can always use common syntax to write a quick note above whatever it is you might have trouble with. So if I want to remind myself right here that this div tag has a default display of block, meaning it takes up the full width of its parent container, I can write in div is equal to display block takes up width of container element. And then I can do the exact same thing for our span tag. If I just need to come back to this at a later point in time and say, hey, a span tag has a default display of inline, which only takes up width of the content within the tags. Well, now I have this neat little comment that I can come back to. So I'm not confused at a later point in time trying to understand what the difference between a div and a span tag is. So on save and refresh, scrolling up to our div and span tags, they're still going to be there. But the cool thing is we now have this nice comment in our code. And if you inspect your element, you'll see our comments are rendered as well. So just a quick little tip for you there regarding inspection. So this really is all you need to know to get started with HTML. There are plenty of other tags out there and I'm sure at some point you'll use them, but to get a really good looking site out there, this really is all you need. You can make some wicked cool websites using only the tags I've just covered. But to do so, we really need to cover the language behind styling these tags, which is known as CSS. We'll be covering exactly this in the next course, and I'm going to share with you all of my own personal secrets, tips, and tricks that I use to make my websites look good while keeping my code as clean as humanly possible. And if you'd like to learn more about HTML and its additional tags not covered right here in this course, there will be a premium HTML extended course that you can find in the courses section of chriscourses.com. But really, I can't stress enough, everything we've just covered is really all you need to get started with web development. All right, so hang tight, stay tuned, and I'll see you in the next course, CSS for Complete Beginners. Peace.